Hello, Chris Potts here. Welcome to our first screencast on SpeechX. My goal for this screencast is to review the core concepts in this area. And then we have a separate technical screencast on illocutionary force and the way that force is constrained by different sentence types like declarative and interrogative and imperative. So that screencast plus this one will provide us with the full theory that we need. And then we'll have a follow-up screencast that takes a more applied angle by looking at some cases where speech acts are governed by the law, which leads to all sorts of high stakes indeterminacy. And those cases are drawn from the book Speaking of Crime, an outstanding book that highlights how linguistic factors and linguistic analysis can be central to criminal justice in the U.S. To start, though, let me briefly review some of the core concepts that we'll be building on. And these are given in our main handout, and so I'll just do a fast review to get them into our common ground, and then I'm going to draw on them as we think about those case studies. So first, locutionary acts. These are simply acts of using language. That might seem mundane, but it hides some real complexity since even this basic notion has a complex relationship with speaker intentions. For example, clearly, I'm engaging in locutionary acts right now for this screencast. And at the other end of the spectrum, I suppose we can agree that if the wind whistled through a canyon in a way that seemed to say the word leave, we wouldn't treat that as a locutionary act, even if it did kind of weird us out. And there may be gray area in between these extremes where people, for example, speak in languages that they don't even understand. But mostly, I think locutionary acts are pretty clear cut and the tricky issues don't really enter at this level. Where they do come in, though, is with the second notion, illocutionary acts. These are things you can do in the world, acts you can perform simply by saying something. I've given some examples here. Assert, question, exclaim, threaten, promise, apologize, command, warn, suggest, request. These are all pretty straightforward, but the list should include very complex social acts like wagering, christening, marrying, bequeathing. These are acts that have complex preconditions in terms of the context and the power the speaker has and so forth. And then we can begin to connect these acts with language via illocutionary force. So the illocutionary force of an utterance is another name for the act behind that utterance. For example, an utterance might be said to have the force of a question or a promise. Just as a quick aside here, I've given a test for whether something is an illocutionary act or something else, right? If you can put hereby into the main clause of the utterance without it sounding odd or amusing, then it's probably an illocutionary act. For example, if I say, I hereby promise to bring candy to the next class, then simply by producing that utterance, I've made that promise. And that's a classic illocutionary act, and the marker hereby just drives that home. Compare that with, I hereby fry an egg, which sadly fails to fry an egg. And we might have some gray area here too. If I said, I hereby insult you, well, that might not really work, but you might still be insulted, so maybe it does work in a way. Uh, anyway, even the presence of these gray areas will find that hereby can have some value in the land of speech acts. Our other screencast covers the topic of sentence types and elocutionary force, and the goal of that work is to find some constraints on which acts can be performed with which specific sentence types. And there are really interesting constraints at work here, but the main takeaway for us right now should be that there is also still a lot of residual uncertainty for example, we can explain why imperatives can associate with this particular range of forces that you see here, but it remains the case that these forces are incredibly varied from commands to well wishes, for example. And so this is going to open up a lot of space for unexpected outcomes in legal contexts where it matters whether a specific act was performed or wasn't performed. Equally important to our discussion will be these properties of elocutionary acts and elocutionary force. I've taken these from Mitchell Green's entry in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and I think they provide a really useful framework for thinking about the nature of speech acts with special focus on the preconditions for performing such acts and their very nature. So let's review these quickly. Starting with the elocutionary point. This is the characteristic aim of each type of speech act. For instance, the characteristic aim of an assertion is to describe how things are. The characteristic point of a promise is to commit oneself to a future course of action. Uh, and we could add that the characteristic aim of a threat might be to make someone feel afraid. Just to add some high stakes examples here. The degree of strength of the illocutionary point. Two illocutions can have the same point but differ along the dimension of strength. 
For instance, requesting and insisting that the addressee do something both have the point of attempting to get the addressee to do that thing. However, the latter is stronger than the former. Mode of achievement. This is the special way, if any, in which the illocutionary point of a speech act must be achieved. Testifying and asserting both have the point of describing how things are. However, the former also involves invoking one's authority as a witness while the latter does not. To testify is to assert in one's capacity as a witness. Commanding and requesting both aim to get the addressee to do something, yet only someone issuing a command does so in her capacity as a person in a position of authority. I think this is a really interesting set of distinctions, especially the issue of commanding versus requesting, right? Even when one has the social power to issue commands, it's still yet again a different thing to actually issue commands because doing so invokes and reinforces those power structures. Next, propositional content conditions. Some illocutions can only be achieved with an appropriate propositional content. For instance, I can only promise what's in the future and under my control. Now, I will say, this is already somewhat delicate. It's often amusing to make promises where one has no control over the outcomes, and I assume that's playing with the propositional content conditions. But sometimes even that seems like it's too strong, or at least these things can be used in a non-literal way, as when I say to you, I promise that you win this race to convey my very strong support, even though I have no control over the outcome of the race. The next example here is perhaps rooted in that Dimitri Martin joke we saw earlier in the quarter. I can only apologize for what is in some sense under my control and already the case. And I suppose that's why it's funny to say I'm sorry and I apologize mean the same thing, except at a funeral. Preparatory conditions. These are all the conditions that must be met for the speech act not to misfire. I really like that word. This is very cool. These are certainly presuppositions and the misfiring intuition is our semantic value of undefined. Such conditions often concern the social status of interlocutors. For instance, a person cannot bequeath an object unless she already owns it or has power of attorney. A person cannot marry a couple unless she is legally invested with the authority to do so, and so forth. Right? These preparatory conditions are really important to the legal cases that we'll look at later. The essence of the issues there will be that we rarely have comprehensive knowledge of the preparatory conditions for complex speech acts that have laws surrounding them. And this can create lots of uncertainty about what people are doing and what they're allowed to do with language. Next, sincerity conditions. Many speech acts involve the expression of a psychological state. Assertion expresses belief, apology expresses regret, a promise expresses an intention, and so on. A speech act is sincere only if the speaker is in the psychological state that her speech act expresses. Now, I think this is okay as a first pass, but it's likely to be more complex than it sounds here. For example, people assert things without believing them. Probably the best we can actually do is talk about public commitment in the current context when we talk about assertion. People can apologize without regret, and then there's often some debate about whether the apology actually succeeded. And of course, you can promise to do a task, but if you privately don't intend to carry it out, well, I'm unlikely to give you a pass, right? You promise to do it whether you meant it or not. Finally, degree of strength of the sincerity conditions. Two speech acts might be the same along other dimensions, but express psychological states that differ from one another in the dimension of strength. Requesting and imploring both express desires and are identical along the other six dimensions above. However, the latter expresses a stronger desire than the former. I suppose that's reasonable and could be useful in making some pragmatic comparisons. For example, perhaps making a request rules out the inference that you want to implore or that you could command, since you would have done the stronger thing if you felt the need to. That would be the an analogous in some way to the quantity-quality interactions we've seen so often where picking the weaker or more general form implicates that the stronger one is false or ruled out pragmatically somehow. Okay, one more concept. This one is easy to state, but incredibly complex. Perlocutionary effects. A perlocutionary effect is an additional effect that comes about through performing an illocutionary act. It's the effect that a speech act is likely to have on others, in Solon and Tirsma's gloss. Now, speakers don't have total control over the perlocutionary effects of their utterances. For example, I might threaten you with the intention of having the perlocutionary effect of making you afraid, but the actual perlocutionary effect might be that you become defiant. 
Or I might try to invite you to do something intending to be open about it, but you might feel compelled to do it due to our social circumstances. Thus, you can see here that my intended illocutionary effect might be misread, leading to a specific perlocutionary effect on you that could have wide-ranging consequences for you that I didn't intend. And that's exactly the sort of tricky situation that we're going to look at in the next screencast.